Me and my other personalities. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to say some warm, gushy stuff that you guys can blank out on, and then I'm going to read an introduction, and then we'll have a reading, and books are available for sale afterwards at the register. Um, but I'm going to just want to say that this, this reading is sort of like, I almost feel selfish having organized it because I'm so ridiculously fond of both Tommy and Stephen, so this is sort of my pleasure to do this. Um, and we're here tonight for Trains of the Gipsy by Robbie Shamir and Parasite by Stephen Boyer. Beautiful, like the one the press style edition. Um, and first, we'll have Stephen with Luke on cello accompaniments, and then Rami will read afterwards. So. Stephen Boyer is the author of Parasite Publication Studio 2012, Ghosts, Bed Boy Books 2010, and they compile, oh, they, <laughs> and they compile the Occupy Wall Street Poetry Anthology. Their work has been published in many anthology scenes and art galleries, second floor projects, Matter, Love, Queer Men, and the Precincts of Surrealism, Rebel Satori Press 2008, Poets Theater in San Francisco, Shampoo Poetry, and Try. This past fall, they've also <coughs> helped curate Girls on Film, and they maintain the blog minorprogression.com. Stephen and Luke. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, once Luke's ready, we're going to get started with a poem for my favorite twink, um, Bear Oliver. Of the never ending story. It's called Sex with Balfour. <laughs> Somehow, the gay porn I found in the vacant lot near my parents' house metamorphosed into Falcor climbing in bed with me. The little twink boy running away from nothing, terrified nothing or good more could get me. I got something four feet long, thick, uncut, so far up my ass I forgot the princess because I had transformed into a cock that would forever barf up enormous lids of cum, pre-cum constantly dripping down my chin. Which relieves the terrible anxiety I'd harbored, worrying nothing was coming. Nothing is scarier for a little twink boy in love with a dragon than nothing pulsating up their ass, stretching the hole, and tearing up their bowels. So tonight I'm wearing a bunch of clothes from friends of mine because um, I really like to wear other people's clothes. Like the underwear I'm wearing is um, from a one night stand and the skirt is like my friends and these are the tights I was wearing when I got mugged a few months ago and then I gave them to my friend who like wore them out, partied a lot to like revive them, you know? I kind of think of clothes as like spirits. Um, so I thought I'd read a little bit about what clothes mean to me from my book. Um, my older sister, Sarah, is responsible for uplifting my fashion consciousness. Her panties were the crown object of my thieving young teen desire. I wore her bras as soon as I had the house to myself. I danced in her dresses and jacked off in her negligees. I called Kayla and chatted about school gossip wearing her G-strings. I played with her makeup, ate snacks in her jeans, piled on her black garb, and pretended I was a gothic princess. Sarah was born three years before me. She remains everything I've ever wanted to be. Um, we'd lay on the sand and read books. She usually wore a skimpy bikini, and I was the cute, weird younger brother, along because I had the privilege of being blood. Hot surfer dudes would climb out of the water and walk past us, dripping wet. If they were total babes, she'd say, hey, you look so awesome, or you look like Kelly Slater, or oh my god, what are you doing tonight? But if they were gross, she'd either keep reading her book or look at me and give me the desired attention. She graduated with high school with a full ride to NYU to major in film and minor in media studies. She was obsessed with Andy Warhol and wanted to project the dark 60s aesthetic on the California fantasy, Disneyland on heroin, which is sort of common considering all the ravers that call Disneyland their choice destination. For getting loaded, when I was 14, she took me with her to a rave there. She told our parents that we were going to a movie, <coughs> then to her friend's house to further discuss the film. My parents believed the lie because they believed everything Sarah said, just as I did. When we got to Disneyland, she gave me a fit of ecstasy. 
I was really anxious taking it because it was my first time taking a hard drug, but Sarah soothed my worries and explained that dropping E would lead me to more beauty. Um, I just like really think it's important that all literature has champagne and incest in it, so that's why like, I included that. I just sent a copy to my mom the other day, and I'm sort of worried like what she's going to think about all the clothes wearing of family members. I think like she'll be able to stomach most of the book, but I'm not sure if that part will affect her. Um, <clears throat> since RuPaul Drag Race just began again, um, I thought tonight I'd read a longer bit about what I think about drag competition. And again, um, thanks to Margarita, I don't know if I said that already, for having me tonight, and thanks to Luke for playing along and then keeping the book interesting for me. Um, this is called You Better Work. Finally freed, I slammed my door and darted to the kitchen for more whiskey, where I leaned against the wall and slowly slid, slid down to the floor as I was pretending to be another despondent movie star. I sipped more enthusiastically the lower I got because I realized I had to get to a club. I painted my nails lime green like a tangerine and then headed to the tenderloin and hopped from bar to bar, looking for someone hot to fuck, but kept succumbing to re-envisioning that dumb fuck client in my drinks. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was becoming some lazy slob that was too desperate to be genuinely cared for. No relaxing vacation, no state of bliss, just the continual need for more whiskey, darling. I retorted to myself as I stared into a mirror on the wall, ever fucking hopeful some dealer would walk through the room. At least your lashes look good. I had money to burn, goddammit. Good hard-earned American dollars ready to be handed over to the drug trade so I could enjoy a little fucking bliss for a goddamn moment. Bored by my thoughts, I picked up a flyer from the bar, an advertisement for a training competition night, hosted by Huglina at the stud bar. The winner of the competition became Tranny Shack's latest big girl, and she'd get a week of performance slot for the following year. As I looked over the flyer, I wondered, did I sleep with one of the bartenders there? I wasn't sure. I was so fucking high the last time I went to Tranny Shack, it's really all just a goddamn drunken orgasmic blur. I fidgeted with my drink as I tried to decide whether or not I should enter the competition. It was just two days away, and I was worried because I had no idea what I'd do. I texted Charlie to see if he'd be down to help me. As I waited for his response, I tipped a drink and looked around the room at all the different people sashaying their lives away, as if the night had anything of distinctive value. I wondered what I'd tell them, if anything. Did I care that they knew me? If not, what lies were worth expounding upon? And what lies would reveal nothing about me? Because everyone should know that lies often reveal more than the truth. The majority of the people in the room made it seem so easy to be there. Like for them, buying a drink was no big deal. Probably paying rent wasn't either. Buying groceries and new clothes and whatever the fuck else they wanted was probably equally easy. I felt like I was completely outside of that reality, and I also didn't even know if it was something that needed to be talked about. Just as I didn't know which aspects of my experience would be of value, because I was not interested in portraying myself as some object to be pity, nor did I want to be a diva. I wanted quite simply to be my best self, but I couldn't shake the whiskey from my hands. OMG. The first time I went to Tranny Shack, I was so clueless, I couldn't understand why all the performers were lip syncing. I thought it meant they were dysfunctional and not good enough to actually sing, but those outfits kept me mesmerized and I stuck around till the band came on and my body flailed. Once Charlie confirmed he was down to perform with me, I stopped anxiously swigging cocktails and headed home. As I walked onto the bus, I explained to Charlie that I'd illuminate all my fabulously colorful ideas the following day because it was much too much to go into, and as he gushed with excitement, I suddenly felt like I was fucking Tammy Faye Baker because I had no idea what the fuck I was going to do. But I also felt like I had to metamorphically bask in the blood of Jesus because life fucking sucks sometimes, and I wanted to be reborn, reborn as a weave child with silver acrylic cat nails and a 24 
with Carrie Bamp things. Once home, I emailed Huglina for a slot in the show. I also asked that I not be part of the competition. I explained in the email that I hate competition, and I asked if it was okay for me to just participate in the drama of the night. Like morality, I wanted to be beyond winning and losing, like Huglina, who is always perfectly imperfect as she provided the necessary illusion of madness. Everyone needed to abandon their inhibitions and fight for the bartender's intention. Yeah, Huglina never lost control. To get real, I don't hate competition. If the competition is between me and, say, like some gay bro fuck that hates my guts, I mean, I'd like to think I'd slaughter the fuck with Black Sabbath on blast because I'm sick of totally living in their world. And they all love to fuck me, but it's also shallow. It's totally the spark to me of love. I wanted more, and I guess I believe my sisters would strive for more. And the way I always wanted the plaster sequins on everything I touch, like Queen Midas. Conversely, I understand the importance of balancing autonomy with community. Autonomy can only exist within a community, and autonomy is not consuming more is community. Every little living thing on this planet can only get by with little help from friends or prey. And it's all imperative everyone awaken and recognize the relationship between the individual and the world. All actions play into the ebb and flow of relationship, action, desire, participation, states of consciousness and being. To be fully autonomous, one must be part of a collective that recognizes such relevance. Sometimes I feel like competition can be funny, but more often than not, it leads like one girl to hating another, and I'm not gonna go there. We have all felt murderous rage. We have all wanted to strengthen an oppressor. We've all woken up to the feeling that Steve Libby articulated in an interview that's psychologically mangled. So why do we model ourselves after a bullshit or margarine culture and compete within our fragile community when we can radically challenge the way we engage one another? Like Divine saying, don't ever stop doing what you're doing. Don't stop, just shoot your shot. It's not that I refuse, not that it's be better than me. It's that I want to sing along with Divine and shake it up as I bounce in the rain into disco lights. Without fearing, my fantasies will end up destroyed. Like what always happened in childhood. I wanted to have a love explosion, and I feel like we're good at creating fantasies, right? We are third spirits, indigo children, with the power to fire rainbows from our eyes as we bark up, bark up and find us love. But when we compete with each other, we prohibit one another from evolving into our fullest selves. <laughs> and we essentially power into the hands of those anthropologists that call us for God was based on the French Bardash, a kind of male prostitute or Padme. The word originates in Arabic, meaning captive or captured. Sure, some girls are able to navigate through competition, but many are not. And revolution is from the bottom, or the imagination creates just an illusion. I don't know if you know what I mean, but I feel very certain about my approach. That third show is an anarchist, pushed and pretty much ruled San Francisco for years as a company member who cleaned a train shack. From my perspective, it seemed like she had seen it all and looked the best. Just the other day, she posted a picture of herself in New York on MySpace. I saw the sister sisters there for the first time in the train shack. Actually, that was how I found out about them, because they played their one date one night, way right before they became super famous. That was such a great night. Everyone in the room was looking at look and dancing, and sometimes for a long time, always drunk in. Um, my favorite aspects of the night was that uh, even in the Netherlands, everyone's look radiated originality, craftsmanship, and the serious ability to thread, which made me gag yeah, because I really believe in repurposing things to have a more popular space. Yeah. 
sweet chain because like I've ruined my life with saved by rock and roll. I couldn't wait a moment longer to try with the club. I needed him deep inside of me so I could ride his heartbeat. It's a stick twitch and you moan ecstatically as you dug his nails when I had some murmured yes. As I walk under the bus, I'm struck by sudden chest pains. I guess I must have smoked a few too many anxious cigarettes as I waited to ride and fixated on my love for Charlie. Is love just a fetishization of an object? Does it matter what it is? I let everyone in, 
except while on stage, for just a few moments, I was going to choose to not give everyone access to my body. Once I finished touching up my makeup, I pulled out two oil cartridges, tied a rope to both, then wound the rope around my body, and pulled the burqa over the whole costume. I made the burqa by cutting slits into a large piece of blue fabric, then draped the fabric over myself with a blue Halloween ghost. I had the oil tied to my body in order to hide it beneath the burqa as a way of representing America's desire to penetrate Iraq. The canisters made me look a bit frumpy, lumpy, and disheveled, which I felt juxtaposed me with the other performers, who were all very careful with their makeup, and Charlie, ever sweet, dutifully played the evil American by coming out midway through the song Burqa Blue with a large pair of shears to cut up my burqa, steal the oil, and then proceeded to raid me. There wasn't penetration, there was nudity, just the facade of one being overtaken by another. Ian Percy Ali wrote, Muslim girls are often told that a girl with a ruptured hymen is like a used object, and an object that is once used becomes permanently worthless. A girl who has lost her seal being unused won't find a partner and is doomed to spend the rest of her days in her parents' home. That is sort of what I was hoping to remind the audience at Trini Shack, that there is more than a nightclub. It's not that I hate the club, but I know how stark reality can turn, and while we were busy fleeing, there are women locked away that have been penetrated. And unlike America, where Larkin Grimm sings, I've been penetrated, so I'm welcome everywhere I go. There are women that cannot exist if they've been penetrated. Sometimes they wear burqas, sometimes they're Christians, sometimes they're Muslim, sometimes they're just poor. As someone that has been, been and has penetrated, it's hard for me to imagine and it makes my insights freeze whenever I'm reminded of these realities. And because I've been within devastating realities, I felt like it's important to try and bring these stories into the world. Maybe it's good to freeze. Ali went on to explain, to avoid this cruel fate, Muslim, fan Muslim families do everything possible to ensure that their daughter's hymens remain intact before marriage. The methods vary according to the country and specific circumstances in which people live and the means available to them. But everywhere the measures are aimed at girls, the possessors have the hymen and not at the men who could break it. The image of a young woman locked in a room invoked a feeling within me that I wanted to stretch far beyond and spatter upon so many atrocities. One example being the American army. Whenever a missile hits, people suffer. It's all really the same. Penetration should only happen when consent is found. But can it be found conveniently, I wondered, as I stood up at the end of my number. Charlie grabbed my hand and we both took a quick bow and then headed off stage. Lena and Peaches Christ immediately reclaimed the stage. He made a joke about the military before announcing the next performer. Suddenly I realized my idea was no longer mine as it had been unleashed upon a room full of people. I jetted to the bar and quickly waved to the bartender who knew to bring me a whiskey ginger ale. I felt a couple pats on my back as I sipped my drink and a hot young professional looking guy came up to me and laughed as he said well done. I felt so fucking nervous. Charlie kept grinning and hugging people which sort of calmed me down but as I watched the final act I wish I had been part of the competition. I felt like such an idiot because there was there was no mention of my desire to be outside the competition. Suddenly I realized I hadn't made any statement. I had signed up to be defeated when the last act ended. If Lena called all the girls to the stage, she went on to explain to the audience that each performer would step forward and the crowd would cheer for who they wanted to win. As the judges, veterans of Tranny Shack, would consider the audience responses. When they decided on the winner, it seemed like every girl got a reasonable amount of cheer. But when it came to my turn to step forward, <coughs> I wasn't sure if it was my ego fucking with the noise level, so I cowered into the noise as if it were static. When they announced Mona Listenho as the winner, I fucking cringed. I wanted to die. I couldn't believe it. All that ho did was dance to Baby one more time, then tore her wig off at the end of the number, cut herself, and poured fake blood everywhere. As I climbed off the stage and wandered amongst my peers, within my cocktail and villain, ever more confused, a femme butch lunged at me and exclaimed with utmost disgust, you created drag that George Bush would like. And with that, I quickly, without question, fled the club, feeling ever more trapped in a body which disgusted me, in a body I didn't want to identify with. I probably should have grabbed Charlie. I probably should have screamed, eat shit. 
Filth is my politics and filth is my life, but instead I caved into my need for drugs. Thank you.